In this video, we will look at the oil resources for the United States and for the world, and we will begin to answer the question, is oil a sustainable resource? There are three conditions for sustainability, as you know. One is, does that particular resource satisfy the needs of the present? And certainly oil is very important. It produces about 30% of U.S. primary energy. The second question is, is there enough of it? Uh, will our use of it now compromise our ability of future generations to have access to oil? That's mostly what we're going to try to do in this video, is to look at what the oil resources are. And we'll also begin to look at the impact that oil extraction and oil consumption has on the natural environment and on human health. Global oil production began in the United States about 1920. Uh, and as you can see in this graph, there was a rapid increase in oil production and oil consumption in the United States. There was a peak in oil production about 1970, and then a decline in oil production. And then suddenly, about six to eight years ago, there was a rapid increase in oil production in the United States. This rapid increase was due to fracking or hydraulic fracturing uh, of shale oil resources. This is, this is the so-called American shale revolution. This produced a great deal of oil. We have a lot of oil now. It also produced a great deal of natural gas. And the consequences of this are interesting and important. Currently, U.S. crude oil production is about 9.2 million barrels per day. This is much higher than it was just a few years ago. And once again, this, is, this big increase in U.S. crude oil production is due to hydrological fracking or, or hydrological fracturing or hydrofracking or fracking. The total U.S. oil production is substantially higher than the 9.2 million barrels per day. Uh, and because additional oil is gained through extraction of liquids during the natural gas extraction process, uh, there's also some of the uh, oil that we use as part of our oil production comes from uh, bioethanol and, and other uh, biological sources of uh, fuel oil or oil substitutes, and this is included in the U.S. oil production. So in spite of the great increase in U.S. oil production, uh, we still import oil. We import about 5.4 million barrels a day, and altogether we use roughly 20 million barrels a day. So it's not true that we're totally independent of imported oil, but we were pretty comfortable in our uh, production of oil and uh, we can be fairly relaxed about uh, our oil imports. We're quite sure because we have a whole diversity of different countries we import oil from, we feel very confident that we can get the oil that we need. This graph is complicated. There are three different lines on the uh, graph. There is U.S. oil production, that's the black line in the middle. There's U.S. oil consumption, that's the red line above, and there's U.S. oil imports. So you can see that in the beginning, back in 1920, we were producing all the oil that we consumed because nobody else was basically in the production business. But then as we began to use more and more oil, uh, we had to import more and more oil. Uh, and, uh, and the problem really hit us during the so-called Arab oil embargo of about 1970, where we couldn't import the oil we wanted because we were on uh, uh, 
difficult relationships with some of the oil producers in the Middle East. Uh, therefore, we uh, had to uh, import less, uh, and as a result, we used less. And that was the time where we began to be, actually be, become more efficient with automobile efficiency. Then, so, and so we had this increasing, as you can see in the green line, we had increasing amounts of oil imports. And the big change in that, as we've talked about, is that U.S. oil production uh, just before 2010 shot up dramatically because of fracking. Uh, and therefore, we need to import less oil, uh, even though we're consuming still a fair amount of oil. So uh, since basically 2010, we're able to produce more of the oil we need, and we're importing less of it. So during the oil embargo, roughly 1973, 1974, this is a crisis. We didn't have enough oil, so we began to actually, uh, we're in a situation we could not as import as much as we wanted, so we began to use less. And uh, as a result of that, we changed for a while our pattern of consumption and our, we went to a more efficient pattern of energy use with oil. So this was the time when Americans began to have more efficient cars. It's the first time that many Americans saw an imported car or began to buy imported cars. Uh, this is the uh, Toyota uh, Corolla, uh, one of the first low-priced, highly efficient uh, automobiles that came into the United States. Since that time of uh, great difficulty with oil, we've diversified our oil imports. And so, in fact, our number one uh, source of imported oil is Canada, followed by Saudi Arabia, a, a very important and very oil-rich country in the Middle East, followed by Venezuela, Nigeria, and Mexico. So we, it's a great diversity of oil resources. We're not dependent only on oil from the Middle East or from oil-producing uh, countries uh, that belong to OPEC. Now, there are two kind of general big categories of U.S. oil production. One is conventional oil, and the other is unconventional. Uh, the conventional oil are the kind of oil fields that we're probably most familiar with. You drill a hole into the ground uh, and you pump oil out of the ground. So that would be a conventional land-based oil producer. Now in addition to these land-based conventional oil production, there is offshore conventional oil production. And uh, as you can see, all of this is in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast, coast of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and a little bit Alabama. So the Gulf of Mexico is rich in oil, and these oil platforms are pumping oil all, all of the time. Because offshore oil production is so difficult and dangerous, there are accidents, uh, the most famous of which would be the BP oil spill in 2010. That disaster uh, led to spilling about 5 million barrels of oil uh, into the ocean of uh, the, the waters of the Gulf. Uh, the impacts of that environmental disaster on the plants and animals and humans in, uh, in and around the Gulf of Mexico still has not been adequately tallied. But this is certainly a very large price that we paid for this oil production uh, facility in the Gulf of Mexico. The unfortunate reality is oil spills like the BP oil spill are inevitable. Uh, with the kind of technology being used, and because this is in water, uh, ocean water, 
and because there are storms that it's inevitable that another spill, hopefully never of this magnitude again, uh, will happen. So in addition to conventional oil, which has its dangers and its environmental impacts, there is unconventional oil. There are two kinds. Uh, one is tight oil or shale oil. Shale oil is called tight oil because the oil is in rock. Uh, which has no access to uh, the surface. So you can't pump the oil out of this without some extraordinary means. So for a long time, people believed that it would be impossible to get this oil. It would be basically inaccessible oil or locked-in oil. The revolution in shale oil technology liberated, made accessible, the oil that is in these type formations, in these shale formations. Basically the way this technology works is a hole is drilled into the ground, a borehole, uh, then the drill rig turns horizontally and for a long distance uh, there is a horizontal drill. Then that hole is sealed off and a great deal of hydrostatic pressure is applied uh, which cracks the rock. Uh, sand is pushed into those rocks which keeps those cracks open and that allows oil in that tight formation, in that shale oil, oil formation, to flow out into the, the drill bore. So that's the idea of hydrological fracking. So even though we admire the cleverness of the, this technology and admire the amount of money and daring people uh, had to invest that kind of money into this technology, uh, we have to look at this and see the environmental and health dangers that this has caused. The biggest danger really is, is the use of water uh, to pump down into these uh, boreholes uh, and the additives that go into uh, the fluids that are uh, mixed uh, in, in these boreholes, the water uh, solutions. Uh, and this, uh, this contaminated water has the possibility of contaminating the surrounding aquifers. It's also true that a great deal of water is used and the water that does come back to the surface uh, can be very salty and uh, disposing of that water is a problem. Because of this water disposal and this water use, uh, mostly in quite arid regions, uh, there's a big impact on oil, uh, water quality. Uh, and there's also an impact because of this underground pumping uh, on the seismic uh, conditions in the region. So there has been recorded and proven that there is seismic activity as a result of hydrofracking and the water associated with this hydrofracking process. Uh, and there also is some very good evidence that uh, the natural gas released in this process can get into water and there have been uh, many cases where people have had natural gas appear uh, in their water, own home water supply. So this is a water problem. There's also an air quality problem uh, in the areas that hydrofracking is uh, being used in great concentration. The other unconventional oil resource is tar sand, or it's also called oil sand. The biggest deposits that are being actively exploited at this time are the Canadian tar sands in Western Canada. This unconventional oil is very unconventional. Uh, we're here in this picture, we're looking at tar sands or bitumen. So this is a form of petroleum that is kind of solid, kind of somewhat squishy uh, material, looks like a very thick viscous mud. 
so this is bitumen, uh, and this has to be treated, has to be processed, uh, so that it be, can become a oil product that can be put into a pipeline uh, and moved out of the tar sand fields to uh, a refinery in another area. So when we look at a tar sand production facility, it's not an oil, I all like an oil production facility. You're not d drilling oil, holes on the ground and pumping up oil. In fact, it's more like a strip mining operation or a water latch pit mining operation where you're digging in the ground and, and removing, removing the top layer and then digging into the ground and mining this uh, tar sand. So this has a big impact environmental impact uh, and uh, it's particularly kind of difficult there's a video you're going to look at because it's occurring in this quite beautiful uh, area of Canada and this production method as you could see will have a very big environment environmental impact and it'll be very difficult to actually restore to reclaim uh, these areas so the production of tar sand certainly has a, as we saw in the previous slides, a fairly obvious gross impact on the environment. But in addition, this is a little bit more subtle, but if we look at the climate pollution, the amount of CO2 released, uh, the processing of the bitumen into oil uh, requires substantially more energy and therefore more CO2 is released in the process. So basically in most cases, it can be worse in other cases, there's about a 20% or so uh, increase in the amount of CO2 emitted, the amount of greenhouse gas emitted uh, for every uh, gallon of oil or gasoline produced. So it's a serious environmental impact uh, due to uh, this particular source of oil. The Keystone XL pipeline uh, is a pipeline plan that is designed to take oil from the tar sand fields of Alberta, Canada, down to the refineries uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a very long pipeline. It, it goes through some areas where there are aquifers on the ground. Uh, so there is a fear that a spill in this pipeline could have some catastrophic effects. So that's one objection to the Keystone Pipeline. The other objection is it would bring this oil produced in a very dirty way, uh, which uh, produces more CO2 than conventional oil uh, would be carrying that oil. So there was great opposition to the Keystone XL pipeline and for the time being uh, this project has been stopped. This is a very controversial area about the best way to transport oil. If you've been following this in the news there have been a number of serious spills because a lot of oil without enough pipeline technology is transported by uh, rail and rail uh, accidents happen with fairly good frequency uh, so there have been deaths and very serious oil spills into waterways and so forth associated with non-pipeline uh, uh, transport of oil. So this dealing with the oil is not a question of just pumping it and using it and refining it in between. It's also moving it from place to place in between. That can be a very dirty, hazardous business. So the bottom line here in terms of actual oil resources is there's a lot of oil out there. There's a lot of oil, there's a lot of natural gas, there's a lot of coal. Uh, and... Uh, there's probably, at current rate, there's probably something like 40 years of oil consumption out there. And there may be more. It depends on the technology. As we saw with the shale oil revolution, there's the capability of finding new technologies to access oil that was hard to access before. 
uh, and the conventional oil is and unconventional oil together are in Saudi Arabia and Canada and other places in the world. So there's a lot of oil. So the answer the second part of the uh, whether uh, oil use is sustainable. There's a lot of oil and there probably will be a lot of oil for a long time. The real question is not so much is there enough oil but should we continue to use it all. There are problems with oil. We know that there are problems with the extraction of oil, the transport of oil, uh, and because those lead to spills and other uh, environmental contamination. But at the end use of oil and other fossil fuels, there's a great deal of CO2 emitted. So right now in the United States, about 42% of the CO2 that we emitted emit through energy uses comes from oil and globally it's about 35 percent. So oil is a major contributor to climate change and so we have to consider whether we think that the benefits we get from oil and other fossil fuels is worth the impact it's having on the climate. The amount of oil consumed and therefore the amount of CO2 released uh, in the United States grew, uh, as you can see from this graph, it's the, it's the big red line. Uh, this is the amount of oil for uh, transportation uh, grew steadily from 1920 up until a few years ago. A few years ago we began to level off and we'll look at that. Uh, the amount of oil uh, consumption for transportation began to level off uh, and uh, it's partly the recession uh, in 2008 but it's also our changing uh, oil consumption patterns. Uh, but there is a lot of oil that we're still consuming uh, and we project there will be a lot of oil we'll con uh, consume in the future. We'll take a look next at global oil consumption. The three lines in this graph show future fossil fuel consumption projections. The middle graph is the projected use of oil, that is liquids, which means in this case means oil petroleum. The projection in the future, this increase in the future, is mostly due to developing countries using more fossil fuels and in the case of oil it's developing countries using more oil for transportation. Developing countries such as China and India are the people in those countries want to have automobiles and want to be able to have the freedom that we have in our use of automobiles. So this is a problem for the future, the problem we're going to have to deal with. Either there'll have to be some way to decrease the amount of transportation, the uh, petroleum use, by having less individual automobile use, that is some kind of mass transit, or there'll have to be some substitute for, for gasoline, or there'll have to be some other technology to replace the gasoline burning engine that we used to. Uh, we'll, we're going to look at this in subsequent uh, units in this course, or in the next chapter we'll actually look at, is we're going to look in more detail at those impacts that oil consumption has on the environment in addition to the CO2 consumption that we talked about today.